it's really nice to meet you, Dr. Benjamin Levy. Thank you. So, Dr. Levy, your area of specialty is pulmonary oncology, thoracic, and I was speaking to one of your mentors. That would be appropriate to call Dr. Ron Blum a mentor. Correct. And he's very excited about having you on the team. And I know that last year you were a recipient of the ASCO Young Investigators Award. But what is unique is that you are really at the beginning of this huge transition in the way we treat cancer, and in particular, lung cancer. And your career is really just beginning in an era that is dramatically different from your predecessors. I think the, uh, the change that we're seeing uh, is, for appropriate choice of words, dramatic. Uh, we really are starting to see uh, treatment changing practice uh, happening uh, with some of the trials that are coming out. Uh, so we're seeing a shift in this paradigm between treating all cancer patients the same, uh, now moving more towards molecularly targeted agents. And that goes for all tumors, and uh, lung cancer certainly is not excluded uh, from that treatment paradigm shift. So I think it's very exciting to see how we move uh, from a general approach of treating all patients the same, uh, shifting to this targeted treatment, trying to identify the appropriate targets and then going after them. So I think it's very exciting. So what do you think really goes on in the minds of some of the older medical oncologists where their arsenal was quite limited and in particular for lung cancer? So, you know, maybe there was the chemotherapeutic agent and there was radiation therapy and now of course there's combination therapy with targeted drugs. But even the communication that's going on between the older docs and now this new generation of younger physicians. I think it's um, I think it's a good point to bring up. I think it can be very overwhelming uh, for the uh, senior physician uh, seeing all of this new targeted treatment and trying to keep up with it when their practice has been the same over the tw past 20 right. to 30 years. Here we are in the past four or five years seeing right. a groundswell. Of, of targeted therapies coming out. So I think one of my roles is to make sure that that communication is open. I think all of us have a role, uh, really, as the junior people to keep those lines of communication open, and ASCO is a perfect venue to do that. I mean, part of my time here has been meeting with some of my mentors and, and, and senior advisors so that we're all working uh, on the same front. I'm curious, in medical school now, and as one goes through their you know, uh, more advanced medical education, when you started medical school, I don't know where the whole area of molecular therapies, I mean, it was just really still probably yet in the research mm -hmm. stages, and, and some progress had already been made, but for your senior colleagues, when they went to medical school, the whole dialogue was different. Talk to us a little bit about that process of medical education in the face of molecular therapies? Even when I was going through medical school, I think it was a uh, you know, treat all the same. Uh, and this was 10 to 15 years ago uh, at the start. So I think, uh, again, the, the, uh, the teaching has to be appropriate. And it, again, it can't be overwhelming uh, because the amount of information out there for each tumor type with regards to molecular targeted therapy is vast. And I think you have to have appropriate selection of what you're going to convey. Uh, to a, a group of physicians who are just getting started in which the over information is already overwhelming. But I think medical schools are already starting to initiate this with looking uh, now just not at neoplastic diseases, but looking at molecularly targeted, uh, molecularly driven neoplastic diseases. So well, I imagine the curriculum is going to have to change. It is. It's going to have to change, and there's going to have to be uh, an initiation of really looking at different disease types at a molecular level and not just at a clinical, pathological, histological level, right. I think it's really going to have to shift, and I think that's, that's going to happen. It's going to take some time uh, to translate what's happening right now uh, and getting it back into the initiation of medical school. But mm -hmm. I think that that shift has already begun, and I think it's probably quite overwhelming for the uh, physician first starting out in medical school, but it's something that they're going to have to grasp because this is the way we're moving now. You must have been in medical school when the Human Genome Project. Correct. Right. Correct. What was that like? It was interesting. I mean, I think that was sort of one of the first uh, uh, 
initiatives to really subclassify and really look down at a genetic level at where we are. Uh, and that was overwhelming. I don't think that was even instituted uh, in the medical curriculum. But I think it's interesting that that came along at the time that I first started. And did your professors at that time tell you, all the students, watch, this is going to be the change in the way we practice medicine? Uh, you know, I don't think there was that awareness. I don't think that this was, even though that was such a huge project, and one that sort of changed the way we think about the human body. I think that uh, as far as translating that into where we're going with targeted treatments for disease-specific uh, tumors, um, I don't think that was really there. I don't think there was an awareness yet. And, I, and I'm hoping that you know, as things change uh, with regards to newer therapies, that there will be that awareness at an early level so that uh, these physicians who are coming out are, are better prepared to handle the onslaught of information uh, that's out there and uh, become better physicians for it. And now it's not only the, the physicians that you know we're dealing with, it's the transformation of the laboratory setting. Right. So and, yeah, having spent two years in the lab um, at Cornell and, and, and having a translational grant looking at basic science and translating that into the, the clinical realm, I think there's got to also be, and it already has happened, a better di dialogue between the basic scientists uh, and the uh, people on the ground uh, testing these drugs in the lab and translating this into the clinical setting. So I think that those lines of communication are open. I think they could be better. And I think physicians also have to ha have a better appraisal of the basic science knowledge that's coming out there because this is where it starts. And unless the physician has some understanding of how these drugs came about and were tested, uh, they're uh, at a disadvantage. So I think the dialogue has to be open between the translational researcher, the scientist, the PhD, uh, and the MD, nurse practitioner, whoever, treating the patient with these drugs. And the other interesting shift is if you look at historically the way the, the hierarchy of uh, physicians in the clinical setting, especially the academic setting, well, it's maybe the first time where the junior physician really has to rise up and sort of have a different kind of a cohesive relationship because the junior physicians may actually have a better comprehension and a new kind of hotter awareness right. of these new technologies and it's a very slippery slope because it can be intimidating and you want to be respectful and at the same time you're probably also now in a teaching position. Correct. I think it's a two-way street because certainly us as junior faculty still need the mentorship and still need the people who have been in uh, clinical medicine to teach us how to run clinical trials, to teach mm -hmm. us what the primary endpoints. At the same time, I think it's important that we educate them exactly. as well. I think you have to have, again, open lines of communication uh, and, and a good mentoring relationship is one in which there is uh, an exchange of ideas. And even now in my, my current position, I see that exchange of ideas and, and looking towards my mentors to really help me design clinical trials, to select the, the, the right agents to do this, um, to particularly uh, focus on a certain type of mutation that we're going to look at. Uh, at the same time, um, they, they need to be aware of what's out there. So not, not, uh, not you know, often what will happen is I will come to my mentor and say, you know, look at, let's look at this drug. What do you think about this drug? We'll educate one another and then I'll take mm -hmm. his lead with regard to running a clinical trial.